Genesis chapter 46, the handouts for the book of Genesis are now complete. We will not finish the book tonight, uh, but the handout that is available tonight will be the last handout that you get. Um, probably in a couple of days we will combine all of these handouts into a single PDF file and upload it to the website. All of them are available individually right now, but in order to consolidate space as we begin new teaching series, we're going to want to combine some of that. So right now you can grab them individually, but probably by Sunday or the first part of next week it will just be compiled into one uh, into one document. There'll be about 32 pages or so. Um, Genesis chapter 46 uh, begins the final movement uh, in the book of Genesis. Jacob's family is now relocating to the land of Egypt. We're two years into a severe famine, and the famine has five more years to go. Joseph has been revealed as the vizier or prime minister of Egypt. He has revealed his true identity to his brothers from whom he had been estranged and separated for 22 years. He has now invited his father and the rest of the family to come down to Egypt. And Jacob was so stunned by the news that Joseph was alive, it seemed almost likely that he would stroke out. He, he, he can't even respond when the brothers first announce it. But when he sees the wagons that Pharaoh has sent and sees the evidence confirming this report, he says, it is enough. I will go and see Joseph before I die. So picking up in chapter 46, we read the first seven verses and then we'll pray. So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said... Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. Then God said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. Then Jacob set out from Beersheba, the sons of Israel carried Jacob their father, their little ones, and their wives in the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They also took their livestock and their goods, which they had gained in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt, Jacob and all his offspring with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, all his offspring he brought with him into Egypt. All right, let's bow and pray as we begin tonight. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would come, the Almighty King, incarnate in Jesus Christ, present in your people as in the person of the Holy Spirit, the triune God who has known us and loved us and saved us. We thank you, O Lord, for all that you are and for all that you do on behalf of those whom you have called and claimed as your own. Father, we pray tonight that you would send your spirit to help us to open our eyes and our hearts as we study this text that is before us this evening. We're thankful, Father, for the re revelation of yourself that you have made in the pages of Scripture, for the encouragement and comfort that we have in seeing your faithfulness to the covenant that you made with Abraham and with his sons and his grandsons into a thousand generations and for the consummation of those promises in Christ. Lord, we give you thanks and we give you praise. And we pray tonight, Father, that you would help us, that our hearts might be trained to see moments like this, not merely as a means to an end, whereby we can recharge ourselves before getting back to what is important, but on the contrary, that we could see moments like this as the end for which we have been created. To know you, to love you, to glorify you, and to enjoy you forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, it's interesting to me, I've mentioned this before, the interchange between Jacob and Israel. These two names of the covenant leader, the covenant bearer right now. Uh, Israel takes his journey to go to Egypt. Jacob is called by God. Jacob is the name of his pre-conversion, so to speak. Israel is his name 
by covenant and by relationship. So you say, well, why would God uh, say Jacob, Jacob instead of Israel, Israel? Maybe it is to reassure this man. Maybe it is to remind him of God's faithfulness to him at an earlier period of his life when Jacob went far from home. You remember Jacob leaves the promised land many years before. He is a stranger and a pilgrim there and he is sent out as a stranger and pilgrim into the land of Padan Aram where he sojourns for 20 years. He leaves home not knowing what is in store for him and yet God is faithful to him there. And in a similar way, and on Jacob's journey to Padan Aram, many years before, God appears to him at Bethel and reassures him of his presence and his faithfulness on this journey. You see the repetition of that idea in this passage? Now here, Jacob is taking a long journey. He's going into a far country. He doesn't know what is in store for him. And yet God appears to him in visions of the night and reassures him of his presence and his faithfulness in that moment. And so he calls to Jacob in the night and Jacob responds, here I am. And then the Lord reminds him, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt and I myself also will bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. That's pretty, pretty powerful encouragement. They are going into what will become a land of bondage. And yet God goes with them there. In a similar way, many years later, God is going to go with the captives as they go into exile in Babylon. And yet his blessing will be upon them and with them in that time. Even in a time of bondage and punishment and exile, God is going to be faithful and he's going to bring them back. And in a similar way, Christians are addressed as strangers, sojourners, exiles, pilgrims in, in a strange land. Peter takes up this language. Paul takes up this language. The writer of Hebrews, who was not Paul, takes up this language in the New Testament. And they apply the experience of the patriarchs to our experience. The parallel for us is not the children of Israel possessing Canaan, conquering Canaan. That's not the parallel for the church today. The church is seen as exiles, as strangers in a strange land. And yet, what does God show us? He shows us continually His faithfulness to His promises, His presence with His people. Even when we go what seems far away from the promised land, God's promises go with us there. Interestingly, Israel is not the first one to offer sacrifices to God in verse, at Beersheba, as He does in verse 1. And you may notice the reference both in verse 1 and in God's words to Him in verse 3 to the God of Isaac. You may say, well, why is he being referred to as the God of Isaac? Why does Jacob offer sacrifices to the God of his father? Why does God say to Jacob, I am the God of your father? Isn't he Jacob's God too? Well, yes, at this point, clearly he's Jacob's God too. But there is a reminder of the covenant here. There is a reminder of the fact that it's not just Jacob and Jesus. Just like it's not me and Jesus. We're part of a covenant community. We're part of a family. And guess what? Jacob is retracing his father's steps. Now, Isaac did not go to Egypt. In fact, he was forbidden by God to go to Egypt. But Isaac did, in chapter 26, go to Beersheba and build an altar to the Lord and sacrifice there. Not only that, but previously Abraham had offered sacrifices to God. had called upon the name of the Lord at Beersheba, presumably sacrifice and altar were involved in that episode as well. What's interesting to me to think about is the possibility that Jacob rebuilds that altar. And you may say, well, it's been too long. That couldn't have happened. Actually, we see that kind of thing happening on several occasions in the Old Testament, where just like Isaac redigs the wells of his father, so too Elijah in the showdown at Mount Carmel goes and finds the altar of the Lord that is broken down and he repairs it and offers a new upon it. And perhaps we can't know for sure. Perhaps that what ja that is what Jacob does here. The Lord says, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. Why not? Because God is going to go with him. And God is going to bring him back. If God goes with you, 
you can go anywhere, right? I told you the story a few weeks ago, I think it was, uh, about the first time I went overseas in missions work. I was going to Eastern Europe, former Soviet Union, and uh, this is my first uh, plane ride, at least in my adult memory, and it's transatlantic, and, I'm, and everything's foreign, and this is a little scary for me. And the hymn that went through my mind so often during those weeks was Anywhere with Jesus. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Right? And this is God's reassurance to Jacob. You can go to Egypt. You don't have to be afraid of that because I'm going with you. And not only am I going with you, I'm going to bring you back again. Now, Jacob's not going to come back alive. Right? He's not going to see Canaan again. And yet God says, I will not abandon you in Egypt. You may die in Egypt, but you will make it to the promised land. Isn't that what God says to us? You may die in a place of exile, but you will make it by my grace to a promised land. And this has to be reassuring when he says Joseph will be the one to close your eyes. You're not going to die on the way. He's an old man, right? Maybe it's, it's too long a journey. Maybe it's too hard. He's, you're, not, you're not going to die on the way. Joseph will be with you when you die. And so Jacob leaves from Beersheba. He takes his family. Did you notice the, the almost clunky, repetitious way that Moses emphasizes in verses 5, 6, and 7? Everybody goes. This is not part of the family. Everybody goes. Some critical scholars deny that. The text seems rather to emphasize it. Now in verse 8, now these are the names of the descendants of Israel who came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons. Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and the sons of Reuben, Hanok, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. The sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. The sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Judah, Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. And the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. The sons of Issachar, Tola, Puva, Yab, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulun, Sered, Elon, and Jaleel. These are the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob in Padan Aram, together with his daughter Dinah. Altogether, his sons and his daughters numbered 33. The sons of Gad, Ziphion, Hagi, Shuni, Ezbon, Eri, Arodi, and Areli. The sons of Asher, Imna, Ishva, Ishvi, Biriah, with Sira, their sister. And the sons of Biriah, Heber, and Malkiel. These are the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter. And these she bore to Jacob, 16 persons. The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, Joseph and Benjamin. And to Joseph in the land of Ephraim were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, the priest of On, bore to him. And the sons of Benjamin, Bela, Beker, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ahi, Rosh, Muppin, Huppim, and Ard. Those are my favorite, by the way. These are the sons of Rachel who were born to Jacob, 14 persons in all. The sons of Dan, Hushim, the sons of Naphtali, Jazeel, Gunai, Jazer, and Shilam. These are the sons of Bilhah, whom Laban gave to Rachel his daughter, and these she bore to Jacob, seven persons in all. All the persons belonging to Jacob who came into Egypt, who were his own descendants, not including Jacob's sons' wives, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph, who were born to him in Egypt, were two. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came into Egypt were 70. Now, you can do this math a couple of different ways, and there are actually two different counts given in different manuscripts and in different parts of the Bible, depending on how you add up the family. I've given you some notes on that, some breadcrumbs to follow if you're interested in that. I'm not particularly, but I do have to say, whoever would name their sons Muppum and Huppum, <laughs> they are my heroes, okay? And if you have twins, you really should consider that, okay? Let me just say that. All right, so... What's the purpose of this? You know, you read these genealogies and you say, okay, it's a bunch of names that we can't pronounce and it's just, you know, it's hard to keep track of. But did you notice some of the things that you were supposed to notice as you read that list of names? For instance, did you notice God's covenant faithfulness? Did you see that God is keeping a family together that prior to this was being torn apart? What did we see back in Genesis chapter 38? Where is Judah in relation to his brothers? Nowhere near him. 
He's moved away. He's married a Canaanite woman. He's got Canaanite kids. And even after she dies, he's not reconciled with the family. He's off sheep shearing and fornicating with his daughter-in-law, right? This family's being torn apart. And yet, when it comes time to go to Egypt, it's like the ark all over in the days of Noah, right? How do all those animals get on the ark? God brings them together, right? Noah's not a wrangler, right? God brings those animals, right? And he brings the animals onto the ark and shuts the door. What does he do with Jacob's family? He brings them together. He gathers his elect for the journey. That's probably the only time you'll see that idea anywhere in Scripture. No, it's not. You'll see it again, right? So you see God's covenant faithful, his gathering together of his people who were formerly being scattered in the world, right? Another thing that you should see is some of the rationale that we've already seen abundant examples of in the last several chapters of Genesis for this relocation. Did you notice the reference to the Canaanite wife? Yeah, so this has happened multiple times, probably with more than just the two sons that we know of. We know that Judah had already done it. We see that another brother has married a Canaanite. They're marrying among the Canaanites. They're having Canaanite kids. And what is happening? They're, they are beginning to reflect the Canaanite culture. That's going to be a sharp contrast with the Egyptian culture that they're moving into. What I want you to see is that God deals with, with Abraham's family as a family. I want you to recognize the household significance of the covenant, right? And, I, and I'm not trying to beat a dead horse or bring up anything controversial, but this is important. This is arresting to me. Coming from a background where it really was me and Jesus, you know, it's just me and the Lord. I'm the lone ranger in terms of Christianity, and if I'm the only faithful Christian in the world, it's just me and Jesus, you know? And uh, no, you're part of a, a covenant community. And God deals with households. Now, let me ask you a question. Are all of these people that are named here in covenant with God? Not spiritually, not internally, not savingly, right? Are they all people of faith? No, they're not. In fact, we know for a fact that some of them are not. And we could assume that many of them are not. Are they externally in covenant with God? Yes, they are. They are. They're sons and grandsons and great-grandsons of Abraham. Are they benefiting from that external covenant connection? Yes, they are. Absolutely. They're being saved from a famine that's affecting the rest of the known world. Are there blessings to being in, in that covenant community? Yeah, there are. Are they saved by that fact alone? No, they're not. No, they're not. And this is, this is an important balance. Sometimes we can, we can drive into the ditch on either side of this road, right? We can underestimate the significance of the household covenantal context. And we can act as if our children are not part of that covenant. Or we can overestimate the significance of the household covenantal context and take for granted the salvation of our kids just because they're our kids. And let me, let me assure you, if you take for granted the fact that your children are going to be believers because they go to church on Sundays, when they grow up, they will not be believers. That, they do not become believers by accident or happenstance. You've got to be praying for those kids. You've got to be catechizing those kids. You've got to be talking the gospel with those children. And then it's only by the grace of God that they have faith. But if you just think that they're going to magically absorb it from being in a covenant context, well, look at Jacob's family. Tell me how that works out, right? It doesn't work out very well. Verse 28, he had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to show the way before him in Goshen, and they came to the land of Goshen. Now, I want you to notice this. Joseph already has said where they're going to end up. Joseph's already identified the new site where the family is going to relocate before Pharaoh has decreed it. But Joseph's got that taken care of. God's got that taken care of. Verse 29, Then Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, in Goshen. He presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen your face and know that you are still alive. Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds 
For they have been keepers of livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. When Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth, even until now, both we and our fathers, in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. This is a remarkable part of the story, and it's one that we can easily blow, blow by without really noticing. Joseph is concerned to make sure that Israel's family is placed in Goshen. It's interesting to me, I was reading some of, the, some of my commentaries on Genesis again today and uh, going back through and noticing that, that some commentators think that Joseph is wanting to emphasize how abhorrent this is to Pharaoh and other commentators thinking that Joseph is trying to downplay it. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how you get that idea out of the text. Joseph is clearly wanting his brothers to come before Pharaoh and, and identify very explicitly who they are so that Pharaoh will put them out in Goshen. So that he won't say, hey, yeah, move into the city, move into the capital, move into any of the towns, uh, mingle among our people, you're welcome here. No, that's not what Joseph wants. That's not what God wants. God's plan for his people in exile is not to intermingle and intermarry with pagans. His plan is for them to be in the world, but not of the world. His plan is for them to be present in the culture, but not to drink in the culture, be part of the pagan aspects of the culture. And so Joseph has already marked out Joseph, uh, Goshen rather, as the perfect spot and so when he goes out to meet his father and there is this tender reunion, Jacob, this completes his life. For Joseph to be alive, he says, I can die now. I'm, I'm, I'm fulfilled, right? This is the greatest blessing he could possibly imagine. Joseph immediately begins talking to his brothers about the plan. Joseph has a strategy here. And I, I don't want to be too speculative here, but... Let me suggest something for you to think about. Joseph has already shown an extraordinary faith, even as a very young man. And not only an extraordinary faith, he's shown an extraordinary amount of discernment, a lot of wisdom. And that is reflected in multiple ways during his sojourn in Egypt, but certainly, by, by no means least, is it reflected in the fact that everywhere he goes, he rises. <laughs> Everywhere he goes, his skills are recognized. He is promoted to positions of responsibility. Even as a young man, he is noteworthy as a person who has great judgment. Do you think that Joseph knows that so many years before, 22 years before, when he was sold into slavery by his brothers, do you think Joseph knows that his brothers were becoming like the Canaanites around them? Do you think that Joseph has some idea that that would be displeasing to the covenant God? I think he does. I think you see that reflected in the choices that Joseph himself makes. Look at the fact that when he's propositioned by a, a powerful woman in chapter 39, he says, I can't do that. That would be a great wickedness against God. <laughs> Your God's clearly abandoned you. I mean, you're a slave in Egypt. What do you care about what he thinks about anything? No, he's still looking at life in relation to the expectations of God, the covenant with God. He's trying to pursue holiness, even though he's far from home. Not only that, but when he's called before Pharaoh, right? And Pharaoh says, I've heard that you can interpret dreams. What does Joseph say? He says, God can interpret dreams. God has that. I don't have that gift. God has that power, right? But if you will share it with me, Perhaps the Lord will give you an answer through me. He's still giving credit to God. He shows a level of discernment that you don't see in his brothers. Fast forward 22 years. What is Joseph thinking about as he reflects on where to put the family as they come into Egypt? Does he think, well, hey, let's just move them down to Egypt and then they just settle where they like, you know? Some of them can go up to Memphis. Some of them can go over to, to Ramses or what will become Ramses. And some of them get here and there and just wherever they choose to, to scatter. No. No, Joseph understands very clearly. You're going to see this in chapter 50. Joseph understands very clearly this is a stop along the road. This is not our final destination. 
Here's something that I wonder. And again, I'm not trying to speculate too much. I just want to give you some things to think about possibly because Joseph's plan here seems too well thought out to be an accident. Yeah. Right? Joseph may know about the experience of his great-grandfather Abraham in Genesis 15. Remember what God tells Abraham in Genesis chapter 15? He says, your descendants are going to go down to Egypt. And they're going to be slaves there for 400 years. And then I'm going to bring them out with great riches. Do you think that story's been told? Or do you think that Abraham just kept that to himself? See, I don't think Abraham kept that to himself. I think that when he is sharing the word of the Lord, the promises of, of God with his son Isaac, with his grandson Jacob, with their sons, I think that story's been told. Now, I don't know whether that factors into Joseph's plans here or not. But here's what I do think. I think Joseph knows that it would be dangerous for his brothers to disperse among the Egyptians. Dangerous spiritually, obviously, maybe even dangerous for them in other ways, because the Egyptians do, like, do not like to intermingle with foreigners, right? He knows that would be dangerous. Secondly, he knows that the brothers are already reflecting the character and the culture of the Canaanites. That was obvious 22 years before. It hasn't gotten any better in the two decades since. And he knows that Egypt is not the final stopping point. He knows that the promised land is Canaan, not Egypt, and therefore the family needs to stay intact. There needs to be a nation that can exodus from Egypt. Now maybe this is just all coincidence. And of course by that I don't mean real coincidence. Maybe it is that God puts all of this together without Joseph really kind of understanding those, those aspects of the equation. But judging by his wisdom in this story, I tend to think he's connected some of those dots. Whether Joseph understands it or not, all of those are clearly in the text reasons that God ordains things to happen in this way. The children of Israel do not need to imbibe the culture of the Egyptians. They need to be isolated from the culture of the Canaanites and they need to remain intact as a covenant community. Let me make one more point before we go on. Sometimes God placing us in a position of exile or even suffering is his way of purging our worldliness and drawing us closer both to him and to each other. Right? Now, sometimes suffering does just the opposite. Sometimes it drives people away. Right? It scatters people. But how often do we see this in Scripture? And how often do we see this in the church? Where God brings some trouble into our lives and it draws people closer to God. They abandon their idols. They purge their habits. And they draw closer to God and to one another. That's a blessing. And by the way, if that is what it takes... For God to deal with your worldliness and carnality. If that is what it takes for you to take seriously the God who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Wouldn't you want him to do that? Amen. Wouldn't you want to go to Egypt if it meant that by going to Egypt I could be saved? I could be brought to repentance? Or would you say, no, I'd rather, I'd rather enjoy my freedom... And have my fun among the Canaanites and live it up among them and go to hell. That, that's what I'd rather. So those, those are sometimes our options. What, what we want is we want to have our fun now and have God when we're done having our fun. And that's not the way it works. So God takes Jacob's family to Egypt to purify them and to prepare them for the fulfillment of his promises. Verse 40, or chapter 47, rather, verse 1. So Joseph went in and told Pharaoh, My father and my brothers with their flocks and herds and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan. They are now in the land of Goshen. And from among his brothers, Joseph took five men and presented them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, as our fathers were. They said to Pharaoh, We have come to sojourn in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks. For the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. And now, please, let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, 
Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them settle in the land of Goshen. And if you know any able men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. And Joseph brought in Jacob his father and stood him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many are the days of the years of your life? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. And Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with food, according to the number of their dependents. So it works out just like Joseph had planned, and apparently as God had ordained. Joseph sends his brothers and his father to Goshen, then takes five of the brothers and his father and brings them to Pharaoh. They have the interview. They disclose that they are shepherds born and bred. Did you notice that? It's not just that we have been shepherds. It's that we, were, we are shepherds and our fathers were shepherds. We are, we are thoroughly abominable to you. Right? That's basically what's being established, Mike. Well, Pharaoh says that he has livestock. Yes, he does. Whatever. Yeah, and it's a Hebrew word for cattle there as opposed to sheep. Yeah. Uh, so is it the fact that they were... Yeah, okay, so this is one of the questions that commentators raise as to maybe the use of livestock in the earlier conversation with Joseph. Joseph's trying to downplay the sheep. To me, I don't, I don't see that connection in the text. So I don't know that that would be the difference. Uh, Pharaoh would have to have cattle and livestock of various kinds just to exist in an agrarian society. But the work itself is despised by the Egyptians. So this is an advantage. We can import foreign labor, you know, we can turn it over to them. We don't have to sully our hands is how I understand that. It's a good question. Whether he saw a difference between taking care of livestock as opposed to taking care of sheep. In either case, what, what word do the brothers use when they're in front of Pharaoh? Shepherd. Shepherd. Yeah. Which again is why I don't think they're downplaying it, Randy and then Lee. Even in Yeah, exactly. Even though it's a common part of their economy, you know, it's a blue-collar job, right? Like, well, as the shepherd, the uh, the pharaoh is not a, a not a stupid man, right? He's he's standing before him yeah. is a very successful shepherd, competent family, what? large flocks and herds with him. Yeah. Why wouldn't you consider Absolutely. turning over? Yeah. Remember, this is this is a family that has frightened foreign dignitaries before. <laughs> right? I mean, you've had foreign dignitaries coming to Abraham and to Isaac suing for peace. And this family has decimated the city of Shechem. Just two of the brothers decimated the city of Shechem. I mean, you know, this is, a, this is an impress. This is not a little group. This is a massive influx uh, of, of people and of wealth. So the decision is made. Pharaoh basically gives his blessing to the decision to move into Goshen. And so they do that. And then there is this conversation between Pharaoh and Jacob, which I find absolutely fascinating. One of the things I find fascinate, fascinating is who blesses whom. Pharaoh is the leader of the most powerful nation on earth at this time. And certainly the most powerful in this time of famine because they're the ones that have got the food, right? The ruler of the most powerful nation on earth at this point blesses the patriarch? No, he is blessed by the patriarch. Do you see the difference between this story and Genesis 18? Excuse me, Genesis 14? Remember in Genesis 14, Abraham meets a king. The king of Salem, Melchizedek. Melchizedek blesses Abraham because Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. Who is greater in this relationship? Jacob. Jacob is because the lesser is always blessed by the greater. In this case, Jacob puts a patriarchal blessing on Pharaoh because Jacob is higher on the food chain. 
Now this is fascinating because Melchizedek is understood in Hebrews chapter 6 and 7 to be the forerunner of Christ, right? Not genealogically, not biologically, not in some type of a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, but just as a type, he is a king and he's a priest, right? And he blesses Abraham because his priesthood is greater than the priesthood that's going to come through Abraham, which is the Levitical priesthood. And the Melchizedekian priesthood is greater than the Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. That's a very important part of Hebrews chapter 6 and 7, right? But here, that is not the case. So you could read Genesis chapter 14 and you could say, aha, so uh, patriarchs are important, but kings are more important. No. No, Melchizedek is more important. It's not because he's a king. It's because he's a priest of God Most High. That's the difference. Guess what Pharaoh is not? Not priest of God Most High. Guess who blesses whom? Jacob blesses Pharaoh. It's said twice. Did you notice that? Because Jacob as the covenant bearer, as the promise bearer, has priority of blessing. Think about that. I want you to think about this for a second. I don't, I don't think we have a nation anymore that would call the whole nation to prayer. We did a few years ago, not that many years ago, right? But let's say, let's say, for example, that we had a national call to prayer. Boy, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be special? Wouldn't that be impressive to God to have so many millions of people praying? No, actually, it wouldn't. It wouldn't actually impress God at all. Not at all. I want you to think about something here. Do you know who has access to the throne of God in prayer? I'm not suggesting for a moment that God cannot choose to hear and respond to the truly penitent prayers of pagan people. He can, he does, read the book of Jonah, right? But do you understand that people as people do not have access to the throne of grace? You don't have the right to God's ear simply because he made you. The only people who have the right... To come into the presence of the Lord God are those who can come in the name of Jesus Christ by His authority, through His mediation, because they are in union with Him. Which means this, that when the nation prays, the, praise that, the prayers that God hears, the prayers that are most effective are the prayers of those who belong to Christ. Which means that a Christian who is a nobody, who is a shepherd, who is a blue-collar worker, abominable to the culturally elite pagans, the Christian has the ability to call divine blessings on the most powerful man in the world. And that is exactly what you are called to do in 1 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul commands Christians to pray for all men, including and especially those who are in positions of government authority. You are commanded to pray for our president, for our Congress, for our judiciary. And you may have to do that with gritted teeth, but you are commanded to pray. You are to pray for them. What does God tell in Jeremiah chapter 29? The exiles in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar has just burned Jerusalem to the ground, leveled the temple, deported the last people. Jeremiah says, and while you're in Babylon, I want you to pray. And seek the welfare of the land where you are sojourning. Isn't that remarkable? You have that opportunity. You have that privilege. You have that power. Not in yourself, obviously, but in the name of Christ. A blue-collar, despised nobody who's in covenant with God has the ability to ask divine blessing on the most powerful pagan on the planet. That is not something to take lightly. That is something to make you tremble when you pray and something to celebrate, right, when you pray. And then the other thing that's remarkable to me about this interview is the way that Jacob understands his life. And again, he says it twice. How does he describe his life? He's a sojourner. But that's not usually what stands out to people. Usually when you ask that question, people say, well, he says that his life was short and hard. Right? Short and full of evil. Well, it was shorter than his father's, and it certainly was difficult. And yet, that's not what's emphasized. Twice, 
he emphasizes that he, like his fathers, are sojourners. The Hebrews writer says in Hebrews chapter 11 that Abraham and the patriarchs were men who were looking for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And that city was not located in Egypt. Neither was that city located in Canaan. That city is a heavenly city, the New Jerusalem. They understood where they were going. They knew where they belonged. And yet Christians today, by and large, we don't have any idea. We don't have any idea. We think that we belong here. And then we sing foolish songs like we want our country back. First of all, it wasn't your country to begin with. And as sick as I am about what's going on in it, Paul says our citizenship is in heaven. It's not here. And when you have your heart set on this place, this planet, this nation, you have your heart set in the wrong place. How would you describe your life? You might say short and hard, right? But do you see yourself as a sojourner? Do you see yourself as a pilgrim, as a stranger in a strange land? That's how the patriarchs understood their lives. And that's how Christians are called to understand our lives. Does that make sense? So three things to notice about that interview that we want to focus on. Okay. Hastening on, verse 13. Now there was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain that they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? For our money is gone. And Joseph answered, Give your livestock. And I will give you food in exchange for your livestock if your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph. And Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the herds, and the donkeys. He supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. And when that year was ended, they came to him the following year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. The herds of livestock are my Lord's. There's nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food. And we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh. And give us seed that we may live and not die. And that the land may not be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For all the Egyptians sold their fields because the famine was severe on them. The land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he made servants of them from one end of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy. For the priests had a fixed allowance from Pharaoh and lived on the allowance that Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have this day bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And at the harvest you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four fifths shall be your own, as seed for the field, and as food for yourselves and your households, and as food for your little ones. And they said, You have saved our lives. May it please my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. So Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt, and it stands to this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth, the land of the priests alone did not become Pharaoh's. Well, now that we know that Joseph's a big government guy. What's interesting here, I think, is actually, because the point here, I hope you realize, is not political. Okay, I'd really rather not debate policy on economics uh, after class tonight. If you want to have that conversation, we can. But um, this is not in any way intended to be understood as a prescription or some kind of a biblical, you know, whatever. No. I think it's actually intended to be a contrast, heightening the sense of exile, heightening the feeling of strangeness, foreignness. We are not in a place of blessing. We are in a place of bondage. And not only the Israelites are coming into bondage, as, as the story continues to unfold over the next few chapters, but, but in fact, the Egyptians are in a place of bondage and they are happy about it. Did you notice that? Don't pity the poor Egyptians. It was partly their idea. 
That they run out of money. Joseph has all of the money. And they say, we're going to starve to death. We don't have any way to buy food. What are we going to do? Joseph says, you still got animals, don't you? Bring us your animals. Now, I think, I think what's going on here is you bring your livestock and you receive credit for that. You take your livestock back home. What are they working the fields with? They're working the fields with their livestock, right? They are sharecroppers at this point. They are working land with animals and seed that doesn't belong to them, even their own lives. By the end of it, they have sold themselves, their property, their animals, and all of their wealth to Pharaoh. And they are dependent upon Pharaoh's benevolence to give them seed to continue to plant and grow. And from that point forward, Egypt's economy functions differently than almost any other civilization in the ancient Near East. Egypt has a centralized government that you will not see in Canaan during the invasion and conquest of the land. Many years later, when Israel comes into the promised land and begins to conquer it, there is not a centralized government. There are city-states. Each major city has its own king and its own army. It controls that city and perhaps some of the outlying regions and towns. The cities figure out pretty quickly the only chance that we have of ever beating the Israelites is if we band together. And yet there is never a centralized government or a centralized economy. Not in Canaan and not in ancient Israel. Not for many, many years. This is unusual. But it heightens the sense of bondage. You see that? The Egyptians are in bondage to their own king. And it was their own idea. Buy us. Buy our land. We don't want to starve. Well, you could spend a lot of time feeling disgusted by that economic policy or feeling sorry for the Egyptians. Or you could see what I think is the point, And that is, Egypt is not home. It's not home for anyone. Not even Egyptians. It is a place of bondage. It's a place of suffering. It's a place where we don't own. We are owned. It's a place where we work and slave for another. It's a place from which God's people are going to be redeemed. And I don't think that it's a coincidence that this story is included at this point. Remember who, to whom Moses is writing, right? Moses is writing during the wandering in the wilderness. Who is he addressing with this? He is addressing people that have just come out of Egypt. What were they in Egypt? They were slaves. What does Moses point out here? The Egyptians were slaves first. You have come out of a place of bondage that was defined by bondage. And then that idea is taken up through the rest of the Bible. Just watch this as you read the rest of your Old Testament and even into the New Testament. All the way to Revelation, you've got all these references to Egypt. And it's never Egypt, resorts, vacation homes, beautiful river, right? See the wonders of the ancient world. It's, it's always Egypt, the place of bondage. It's always Egypt, the place you don't want to go. And Moses is showing that to us all the way back to the time of Joseph. Isn't it interesting that Joseph is providentially used by God to create the centralized power and economy that God will eventually use to destroy the entire nation? Do you realize that the plagues and all of the events that ensue as a result of the exodus would not have worked the way that they did if Egypt didn't have a centralized economy? Well, that's getting into Exodus, and we're not there yet. So, verse 27. Thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they gained possessions in it and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. Does anybody see a contrast here yet? And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were 147 years. And when the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. Joseph answered, I will do as you have said. And Jacob said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. 
And Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. Now, the next couple of chapters we're going to get into the blessings that Jacob gives to Ephraim, Manasseh, and then to his 12 sons. And so that will ultimately conclude our study of, of Genesis. Lord willing, I, you know, there's three chapters of material. That's a lot. So it may be that we've got two more weeks. I think we've got one more week. We'll see. But, uh, but that we will leave for next week. But do you see the contrast there right at the end? What's happening with the Egyptians? The Egyptians are becoming slaves. What's happening with the Israelites? The Israelites are prospering. That's about to reverse itself, you realize. Israel is going to become the slave. Egypt is going to prosper under their servitude, right? And then God's going to deliver them. But do you see that contrast? God, God is creating the very scenario that is going to lead to the enslavement of his people and then is ultimately going to lead to the destruction of Egypt. Because you know what the Exodus is about, don't you, right? You know what, what that's about? It's, it's about liberation. It's about freedom. It's about the fact that nobody should ever be a slave. No, it's actually, Exodus tells us, about God judging the gods of the Egyptians. He rescues his people. And he manifests his glory by pouring out his wrath on the gods of Egypt. And 400 years before, he is setting them up to do just that. Joseph pays the way. But again, some of that's getting into Exodus, and we'll, we'll get there soon. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? All right, hope there's something there for you to, to appreciate. I hope, if nothing else, you're, you're encouraged to read more in, these, in this Old Testament to see how these things fit together. And I hope that you're able to pick up some of these thematic uh, ideas that are going to run all through the Bible to realize that the Bible is one story. It's about there's one hero and it's God and it's the same promises all the way through the same covenant of grace all the way through. And and hopefully it causes the Bible to start making sense for you in a way that it may never have before or that it has, but but not to this extent. OK, that's the idea. All right. Let's bow and let's pray before we go tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time and opportunity to spend in your word together as brothers and sisters to reflect on the tremendous privilege that we have to be part of your people, to be part of the body of Christ, to live in covenant with you, to have the privilege of seeking divine blessing even for the pagans among whom we live. God, we pray that we would not take that privilege for granted but that we would pray without ceasing, that we would be constant in coming to the throne of grace to find the mercy and help that we need so desperately every day. Father, I pray that you would bless this passage as it rests upon our hearts, that you would bless it and water it, nourish it and cause it to grow, to strengthen our faith, to bear fruit that glorifies you. Please use us, Father, for your glory. Use us that we might have opportunities to share Christ and the good news of salvation in him with those that we meet. Please use us even this week. Give us such opportunities, Father. And we pray that you would bless us with an opportunity to come together again to worship your holy and matchless name. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.